how we live and deal and do community together. That by how we minister to one another, we're training and preparing ourselves to minister to others. And, and really, last night was a reflection and, and kind of a work of that. We had people in here in the church last night that aren't going to come to church on Sunday mornings right now. But our prayer is that as they keep having more and more touches with us, that they keep seeing God working, whether they want to say it's Him working or not, but they just go through that experience that God's love can keep drawing them in. And so last night was a kind of that beginning of the, the inner circle of us ministering to one another and to the people around us working out. Today I want to talk about us ministering to our neighbor and what that looks like and, and how important it is and how we could be effective in it. And ultimately, what it comes down to being effective, it means letting the Holy Spirit work and move within us. But it also means us seeking to fulfill the way God wants us to live each and every day in our lives. The mission matters. Loving our neighbors matters. Every Christ follower should love their neighbor. We should do this because it's a commandment from God. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, this is the first and the most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So that's the first thing. So we need to love God with everything that we are. And here's the thing. The way we love God with all that we are is by loving one another and loving our neighbors. In Leviticus 19, 9 through 18, yes, Ron, I'm using Leviticus. In Leviticus, there's a, even the name of Leviticus scares me because it seems like this, like, Leviticus. I don't know. It's just, and if you've read through Leviticus, there's a lot of things and directions and stuff like this, but this might be one of the most important passages in Leviticus because it's the one that Jesus is, is ref, Jesus is, Jesus is referring to when he's asked the question that we're going to go over in just a minute. When you reap the harvest of your land, you should not reap your field right up to the edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after you have harvested, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the so sojourners. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my, by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. That passage, I think, is a passage that we could all read every day just so we'll deal with our spouses in a right manner. With our kids in the right manner. And all of our neighbors in the right manner. Because that passage is talking about how we go through life. That we're not to go through it and try to get everything that we can out of life for ourselves. But we're to take everything that we have and understand it is a gift from God and be willing and look for opportunities to bless one another with our lives. We live in a world that tells us to take care of ourselves. We have a creator that is telling us to love one another. Everything we do and how we live. You shall not do no in, <clears throat> injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or deter to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbors. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother 
in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Here's the thing, we are all capable of asking questions that keep us from moving forward for Christ. This next passage we're going to read, there's this religious man who is referring back to this Leviticus and, and the Deuteronomy passages. And he's asking the question, well, who's my neighbor? Because see, for Israel... What they had become, they had become such a, a proud people that were not good at being God's people, but they were proud of it, of who they were just by birth, that they kind of put up walls to keep the rest of the world out from them. They, they felt they were so much better because they were God's chosen people that they forgot why God chose them to be a light on the hill. That God chose them to be a people that worshipped Him in such a way that other people would want to come worship Him because of the blessings that God had put upon them. And time and time again, we see Israel going in and out of serving God in the right way. We see what, under King David that the nation was growing and people were starting to get it right. And then we saw under his son, that King Solomon, that, that there was this, this great blessing. But even by the end of his life, he started to lose focus of God and what he was doing for him. And we start to see a splintering and issues arising in Israel because they... They're not staying focused on what they were meant to be as God's people, a city on a hill. And so this Israel teacher is trying to, in essence, make it so he only has to take care of a few people around him and not love on all of his neighbors around him. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law, and how do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. So Jesus says, Look, you got it right. Do this, and you will live. Now here's the question that we want to ask so we don't have to really love everyone. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So from, if you just read through the story, you say, okay, be the guy who goes up and loves him. Now, the thing is, in a group of, of Jews and Hebrews that Jesus would be telling the story of, for them to be told that they're not as good as a Samaritan would be awful offensive. You see, Samaritans were half-breeds. And they didn't worship on the right hill as they were commanded by, as Israelites by God of where to worship. 
and to give sacrifice. And if you have been in the Word before, you know the story of the, the woman at the well. She was also a Samaritan, and that yet is another story that is quite shocking in the times of Jesus. But Jesus tells a story. He says, look, a priest passed by. He sees the man, and he goes to the other side of the road. He's got more important things to do. He's got to go and get ready for people to come and worship. And, 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 and he's got to keep himself clean because he's a priest. So he can't deal with the riffraff that's been robbed and beaten on the side of the road. He, he does not have time for it. Because worshiping God is just too important. Then a Levite. Who are the ones who who go through preparing and getting things ready for the service. They're too busy to go help and take care of this guy. I mean, and they've got to get to where they're going and do that because they need to get to where they're going to go worship God. And he too passes on the other side. But then a Samaritan who's traveling down a road and it all sounds like he's traveling by himself and the last guy who traveled by himself got robbed. He sees a guy who's beaten on the side of the road. He, not, he must not even worry about if it's a trap or not. He sees the guy and he goes to him. And he goes into the house of worship and he worships with God right there and he takes care of that man. Two denarii were a whole lot of money back in the day. It was enough to take a guy to the end pay for the inn, pay for the bandages, pay for someone to help take care of him. And then he says, if more is needed when I come back through, I'll cover that cost as well. The guy's helping take care of someone he doesn't know. He took a risk in even helping him. Because how did he know the robbers weren't there to jump him as well? He put him on his, in his animal and walked. Put that burden on himself. And he's a Samaritan. And Jesus says, look, this is a man who loves his neighbor. And see, you have to love your neighbor like this if you want to love the Lord your God. You can go to the temple and you can go through all the process and you can go through all the religious things of worship. But if you're pr passing by on the opposite side of people's needs and not taking care of the people that are around you, then you're not loving me the way I desire for you to love me. He desires that we love one another and not sacrifice on the altar, but that we take care of and care for those who are around us. When we read through that Leviticus passage, we see that to love God means that we're going to be humble, loving people, that, that we're not going to be so greedy that we have to hold on to everything to ourselves to take care of ourselves, but we're going to understand that we need to take care of the world that is around us. That the poor will always be with us. And we're not to judge anybody by the class that they're in but by who their creator is. Jesus taught us some important ways to love, one, <clears throat> to love our neighbors it, in Luke 19, 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. As I grew up, he was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Because he was small in stature, so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree. A sycamore tree did he to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, 
hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Remember how I talked about that Samaritan wasn't very well liked? Tax, collect tax collectors were hated by the brethren because they had sold out to the Roman Empire to be tax collectors. They had chosen wealth and money over their religion and their heritage. Zacchaeus' friends and the people he hung out with were not from his lineage and his, and his heritage. And Jesus says, I want to come stay with you. Taboo in these times. And when he saw, oh wait, did I go home? I stay with you. And when he saw it, it and when they saw it, they all grumbled. That's the religious people. He has gone into the, <clears throat> to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And they're not being polite when they call him a sinner. They're saying he's going into the house of a man who is a dog. Lower than a dog. Swine. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You see, Jesus teaches us some important actions to take in loving our neighbors. The first action is this. Seek them out. The second action is to love them where they are. The third action, be willing to look bad to the Pharisees. And the fourth, let the Spirit transform them. The first action of seeking them out. Jesus calls Zach, <clears throat> Zach, Kius, down out of the tree. This is a huge point of emphasis in this story. Jesus has people all around him. Jesus has been healing the sick. He's been giving sight to the blind. Even when lepers just call out to him and want to be healed, if they're standing up on a hill, he's healed them. And of the group, only one of them came to thank him. But yet, Jesus keeps just loving on people and taking care of them. He's going down the street, and there's this wee little man up in a tree. And all of the crowd around him know who he is. Because he comes and takes their money and gives it to Rome. And he's obviously been taking a little bit more than he should. Because we know in the story later, he says that he's going to pay those people back. And this guy is up in this tree. And Jesus sees him. And seeks him out and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to come to your house and stay with you. I'm going to be in your presence. When the world around me says I shouldn't be in your presence because you're just too bad, too dirty, and too much of a sinner. But I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to seek you out. Second action Jesus takes is loving them where they are. Jesus goes to his house to stay and to eat. Now Jesus didn't have a, pla a place of his own. 
We can know by how he sent out his disciples when he sent them out that he, he's traveling just with what he has with him. He's not carrying a big 60-pound backpack full of ready-to-eat meals that you just have to heat up on your little camping stove. He's walking into a town not knowing where his next meal is going to come from. But he also knows that he's part of a people and because of his knowledge of the word and, and being a rabbi that he could almost go into any religious leader's house and they're going to take care of him. And by the standard of the world that he's in, that's the only people he should be eating with are the high elites. Because they're the only ones that would be close enough to be cl clean enough to sit and eat with a rabbi. And he calls this guy down out of a tree and he says, I'm going to come stay with you. I'm going to come eat with you. I'm going to break bread with you. You and all your friends of tax collectors, thieves, robbers, and prostitutes. And we're going to sit and have a meal together. Jesus didn't care what the Pharisees thought of him. He cared about loving God and serving him with every ounce of his being. The third action, the willing to look back to the Pharisees. Jesus is looking for opportunities to love on people that nobody else wants to love on. He touches people who have leprosy. He spits in the dirt and rubs on people's eyes so they can see. He heals women that touch him through the crowd. He eats with those that the religious leaders say he shouldn't be eating with and in doing so he offends them and makes himself look bad and he doesn't care because he's more worried about loving the people that are around him than the religious leaders that are trying to lord over him He's more worried about God than the priests. Because he wants to show love to everyone who is around him. And the fourth action Jesus took was to let the Spirit move to transform a sinner's heart. You read this passage, you, you see that, that at no point does it say that Jesus taught Zacchaeus all the things that he needed to be doing. Zacchaeus knew the law. Zacchaeus would have grown up in a household where he would have learned what it meant to worship God and what it was to look like and how we were supposed to live. He would have known Deuteronomy passage and the Leviticus passage that we talked about and everyone before him and everyone after them. He would have learned those as a young boy. And he would have knowingly made a choice to walk away from that. And yet, Jesus calls out to him, goes to his house, loves on him, and that love brought the Holy Spirit into that room and into his house and transformed it forever. It wasn't Jesus shaking him to understand what he was doing wrong. It wasn't Jesus reminding him of the Ten Commandments. It wasn't Jesus telling him that, hey, all these things that you're doing in your life, you need to change. All this money that you've taken from people, you need to pay. Jesus, we never see in this passage that Jesus did any of that. He went, he sat with them, and he ate with them. And he put himself equal with them to raise them up to the Father. Because he loved them truly with his heart. And he knew that, that love, the love that comes from God, the love that the Holy Spirit will fill each and every one of us with will transform people's lives more than our words ever will. 
We are called to be in the Word for a reason. Because when we get into the Word, that means we're getting the Holy Spirit to indwell within us and give us power and passion to serve and to worship God. God wants us on our knees to pray and to put everything before Him because it gives an opening for the Holy Spirit to fill us and work in our lives to make a difference in other people's lives around us. God wants us to be so concerned with other people around us that it leaves us wide open to receive His blessings. God doesn't want us to be putting up barriers and walls and protecting ourselves and making sure we don't go anywhere that we're not supposed to go or do anything we're not supposed to do. He wants us to be so focused on Him that we're, we're seeking and walking in the right path to love people around us that it'll keep us inside the right lines to make a difference. That in seeking Him, we will be able to walk on the narrow path that will take us to righteousness and His glory. But in while we're doing it, because we're loving God and loving those around us, it's going to bring others with us. Jesus' passion was to raise others up to be with Him and the Father. He did not come to condemn the world, but to rescue and save the world. And we are called to be and do the same. And we do it by taking these actions, by actively seeking people out to love on them. And surrendering our will for God's will will make a difference that cannot be stopped and cannot be contained. When the Holy Spirit is moving within us, it'll take that which man desired for evil and it'll turn it to good. It'll take when someone loses their life but has faith, it'll make it a thing to celebrate. Even though we mourn, we'll be able to celebrate. And we can celebrate Denny's life because of who he is and who he loved and what God had done for him and that he had accepted it. And God wants to do the same for each and every one of us. And he doesn't want to just do it for those that are in this room. He wants to do it for every person that's in this county. And every person that's in this state. In this country and in the world. Because God knows and wants to have a relationship intimately with each and every one of us. And the way that happens is when we who know him allow him to work in our lives and to set us free to love on those around us, to make a difference. It changes everything. It means we can take our hobbies and the things we love and we can connect it with God to make a difference in people's lives. It means we can do things we don't even like to do, but we're going to do them because we love the people that like them and we pour into it so God will work and make a difference in people's lives. Loving our neighbor is an everyday opportunity that allows God's love to permeate our everyday actions. Loving our neighbor is an everyday opportunity that allows God's love to permeate our everyday actions. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this day. Lord, I ask that you will just Fill us with your love. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with your excitement and your spirit so we can be the light, that we can be the love, that we can not only reach out to one another in Christ, but we can reach out to the world around us. Lord, we ask that you will just take the funds that came in yesterday for our, <clears throat> for our missions fundraiser, and you will do immensely more than that dollar itself can do, that you will anoint those funds and do amazing things for your kingdom. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. Let's stand.